health junkies. It's time for The Health Fix. Join your host doctor, Janine Krause, as she gives you a dose of what you need to know and do right now to take control of your health from the inside out to rebel against aging, look damn good, fight stress, and laugh every day. Hey, health junkies, welcome to another episode of The Health Fix. I'm your host, Dr. Janine Krause, and today I'm going to be geeking out with Dr. Jerome Saris. He is a clinical research fellow, professor of integrative mental health, and deputy director of NICM Health Research Institute at Western Sydney University in Australia. He moved from clinical practice as a naturopath, nutritionist, and acupuncturist, like me, to academic work after completing his doctorate at the University of Queensland in the field of psychiatry. He worked under a legend in the herbal medicine world, Kerry Bone. He is the co-founder of Medi Herb Company, by the way. Great herbal company, just saying. Professor Sars has an interest in anxiety and mood disorder research, and in particular, he's looking at how nutrients and supplements and herbs affect our psyche. And I think that's really cool. He also consults as a clinical advisor for companies that sell kava, such as the brand Fiji Kava. Today, we're going to be talking about his research with kava and the things he's learned along the way. So let's get on to the podcast. Okay, health junkies, I have Dr. Jerome Saras on the line today. He's got a little bit of a disclosure he has to give for you guys before we get started here. So, Dr. Saris, welcome to the Health Fix podcast. How are you doing today? Well, uh, my voice is a little croaky. I had a bit of uh, local anesthetic yesterday, so uh, it's given me a nice Barry White, you know, sort of vocal intonation <laughs> here. So, uh, don't, you know, don't get too excited, listeners. <laughs> I Aside like, from that, I'm okay. I'm okay, thanks. You're doing well. Good deal. So let's let's get that disclosure out of the way so we can move forward talking about kava. Yeah, no, no problem at all. Yeah, usually it slips in quite comfortably, uh, but it sounds quite ominous now. It's uh, it's, not, it's nothing too stressful. I mean, I've conducted, obviously, uh, independent research as an academic for many years and done a lot with uh, kava, but uh, recently uh, I do some... Uh, well, independent objective, but still uh, scientific advisory based work, which is paid to companies who do sell carver. So I always as an ethical academic like to disclose that. But that being said, uh, everything I say is from my own heart and brain. And uh, I will play it with a straight bat, as we say <laughs> in Australia. Sounds good. Sounds good. You have a lot of research that I found when I was digging into Kava Online, so I can't wait to talk about this. First things first, I want to know how did you come to decide to dive so deep into Kava? How did this break down for you? Many years ago, I guess I've always had a a real passion, a real interest for natural products uh, and the effect of in a sense, nature in a medicinal uh, respect and its effects on the brain, the effects on different plant medicines, on improving mood, reducing anxiety, improving sleep. Uh, and around the time of my doctoral thesis, sort of looking into plant medicines to study because that was one of my passions, Carva really did uh, you know, sort of leap out in the literature as a really, you know, quite a fascinating plant medicine which had a range of psychotropic uh, effects which you know look really beneficial for you know various mental health applications. So I decided to do some research in that area. Very cool. Very cool. Now Fijian kava is kind of your type of kava that you've done a, the majority of research in. Is that what I'm understanding correctly? In fact, actually, the the, the research we've done our clinical trials on has been Vanuatu okay. uh, based kava, but. The, the critical thing really for listeners to understand is that the types of kava, they are different, um, but as long as they are, you know, locally understood as good quality, good drinkable kava, which are known generally as noble cultivars, uh, and, and these are spread across the South Pacific. So as long as you're getting good quality kava, uh, you will get a similar therapeutic effect. So if you get a good quality kava from Vanuatu, uh, you know, it's, it, it is similar 
uh, potentially to something you might get in Samoa or um, Fiji or so forth. But Fiji certainly does have very good quality, uh, noble cultivars of kava. Okay. Okay. I think that's something important for folks to understand because we in the U.S. here have had a lot of bans on kava because of reported liver issues related to kava. Can you speak a little bit on that so that we can just kind of clear that elephant in the room about kava right off the bat? Yes. Look, it is a, a, bit, a bit of an elephant. I mean, what I would say is certainly in the last decade and a half, there really hasn't been anything come to the fore in terms of any kava concerns related to the, the liver. Certainly nothing in the, the medical literature from what I can see or uh, pharmacovigilance uh, websites. There was some concerns around uh, sort of the early 2000s uh, in regards to a potential link with um, some liver toxicity. However, you know, the, a lot of the concerns were based on European products and while we haven't gotten to the bottom of, of what was going on. It tended to be, from what we understand, uh, the use of poor quality kava, so using mm-hmm. the incorrect uh, plant species as well as, say, for example, the um, uh, the stems or the aerial uh, the leaves and, and, and bark and so forth, which really is not what's used traditionally, and also using solvents such as ethanol um, and acetone. So, um, you know, the... There, there were some, some issues in terms of how the manufacturers happened. Since then, there's been, from what I understand, more of an attempt to use, you know, the, the root stock of kava, which is what is meant to be used, certainly traditionally, um, for a safer effect, and also ideally uh, potentially using a water-soluble method as well, which is what's used in the South Pacific. So since then, uh, really, there, there hasn't seemed to be, to my knowledge, any, any real safety concerns okay. uh, in terms of liver. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that because, yeah, when I, I'm a naturopath just like you, and uh, back in the day when I was at school, that was kind of this big thing that we were talking about, and I started Bastyr University in the early 2000s, so it makes perfect sense in terms of the time frame, so I, I, and I still hear it from patients today, so I like to kind of clear the air on that. So tell us, how does kava work for anxiety and what form would be the best form for listeners to use? Well, it, it works via six major uh, constituents for, from the plant, uh, which are quite high in the, the root stock, which are known as carvalactones. Okay. Uh, and these lipophilic resinoid uh, compounds, the carvalactones of, of which are six, you know, depending on the cultivar, they may have different ratios. So we, we look for cultivars which are preferentially high in uh, carvane or dihydro uh, carvane and lower in dihydromethysticin, uh, which sometimes uh, can impart a nauseating feeling. And they're found uh, more so in what's known as two day carva, uh, which is generally not drunk so much, um, you know, around the South Pacific. It can give a bit of a hangover effect. So it it will have its effect, these carvalactones, on the brain and in terms of reducing anxiety and and, and imparting muscular relaxation via the GABA system. So sort of working on GABA pathways and by by the GABA uh, pathway, it will elicit muscular relaxation and and, and an anxiety-reducing effect. And it's via, if you want to get technical, sort of, modulation of the uh, the calcium channels, which sort of allows uh, sort of more GABA transmission. And GABA is the main inhibitory uh, neurochemical, which gives us that sense of relaxation. Thank you. I like to geek out a little bit, and I'm hoping my audience does too, because for me, I, I like to know exactly what is this doing in my body. Now, along with this and the muscle relaxation effect, some folks might be thinking, oh, wow, this could be really great for a post-workout. Say they ran a whole bunch of miles and their muscles are feeling kind of tense, things of that nature as well. So what else can kava be effective for when it's working on that GABA pathway? So we've got anxiety. What else? What else can be helpful? Well, and, and I will say this is largely anecdotal evidence because the majority of our, our randomised controlled trials, uh, which we can talk to uh, later on, uh, tend to focus on anxiety and stress. 
Uh, but anecdotally, I, I mean, you do get a lot of feedback that people use kava for muscular relaxation. So certainly some athletes, uh, our rugby players, uh, will use that uh, as, you know, some people may use alcohol to relax you know, and, and chill out, uh, that people have a few bowls of kava after their you know, rugby game. And it's, you know, certainly colloquially will, you know, be communicated that it imparts physical relaxation. They feel chilled, they get a good night's sleep uh, and, and some muscular relaxation. So I think there are certainly some applications in terms of improving sleep and reducing muscular stress, uh, but we really do need to do some proper randomised controlled trials to, to, to see the actual scientific effects of that. Okay, makes sense, makes sense. In terms of taking kava and dosing kava, I hear you talking a lot about drinking kava. And I'll be honest, as a naturopath, I never had the chance to drink kava. I actually only was exposed to tinctures of kava. So I would love to hear how kava is dosed and how it is available in Australia compared to what we have in the U.S. Yes, well, look, there are many, many different ways of taking kava. I mean, the traditional way, obviously, is you've got your, your kava bowl in Fiji, it's the tanoa. Mm -hmm. uh, you put your ground, comminuted kava root, dried root, in the, the bowl, in the tanoa. You put your water mixture or sometimes some coconut uh, water as well, and then you sort of um, uh, put it into a sieve, I should say, first, uh, a Muslim uh, cloth, and you put your water in, and then, uh, you know, you sort of, give it a little bit of a squeeze to sort of massage out the uh, kava lactones in the water and then drink, you know, your, your kava sometimes via a coconut bowl. Uh, so that's sort of a traditional way. So you can do it that way. I mean, people can use micronized kava where they can just literally put a couple of teaspoons into some water and mix it up and drink that. Sometimes people might do kava tea bags as well. Um, and then there's capsules, tablets, um, as well as some tinctures. Obviously, usually the tinctures are alcohol uh, ethanol based, uh, which is actually qu quite a good solute in terms of drawing out the resinoid constituents. Uh, but as I said, you know, there's always that concern about, um, you know, the interaction with ethanol uh, and kava. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, yeah, it, in an ideal world, that's tended to be avoided. But uh, yeah, they're, they're the various methods which, which people uh, can, can use kava currently. So if someone's going to use kava, how often can they use it? Can you use it on a daily basis? I, obviously, with the tincture and the liver concern, I wouldn't be thinking that. But say if someone had micronized kava or capsules, would you think that in terms of your research, have you found that folks can use it on a daily basis, day in, day out, or should they cycle it? What's, what's recommended? Yeah, it's a really interesting one because I, I think listeners need to I guess, kindly appreciate that there's the recreational and cultural use and then there's the medicinal use. And sometimes those two do intersect. Um, but, you know, over in the South Pacific, people will have sometimes a bowl or two of kava a day, you know, and they'll just relax in the afternoon, that's it. Sometimes you get people who will hit it very heavy and they'll have 20, 25 bowls and sort of pass out, um, <laughs> you know, from that perspective, yeah. So it can be in, in, in regards for that. That could be uh, classed, obviously, as an inebriant. Yeah. You know, an intoxicant at that level, you know, of, of, of dose. But then you can have people medicinally just having a capsule or a, pardon me, a, ta a tablet or two. Um, and then, you know, get, getting a little bit of a mild relaxation effect from that because it is dose dependent. Um, but from a medical perspective, <clears throat> and this is just based off how it's recommended in the medical literature in terms of treatment guidelines uh, for kava to be used. Uh, but also based on our own research. Um, I guess the, the, the take-home message is, uh, look, for some people, you know, they take it every day, no problem, and it works for them, great, you know, no issue at all. Certainly I'm not encouraging anybody to have any, uh, you know, substance at very high doses continually, you know, and I, and I would argue that for any, uh, any substance which can have an intoxicating effect, I mean, it's just like if you overdose, you have too much uh, wine or if you have too much, uh, I mean, anything really. Mm -hmm. I would say uh, caffeine, you have too much coffee, you know. It's, you know, you, you, you want to keep things ideally in moderation. Um, but that being said, I mean, Carver in regards to our research has shown that 
and looking at the breadth of research that it may not necessarily be uh, suited towards people with chronic clinical levels of anxiety who you know really are suffering with very high levels of anxiety they 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 would, would more ideally be placed to see a, a psychologist to get psychological care possibly to go on to medication um, our research has shown that Carver really doesn't necessarily have a, 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 an obvious strong role in terms of treating that um, but then certainly for milder cases of anxiety, stress, situational cases of anxiety. I mean, I will give another disclosure that, you know, when I do public speaking sometimes, you know, I'll, I'll have a few capsules of Carver, you know, an hour, hour and a half beforehand. And I find that it does have a, a relaxing effect on myself. It still maintains, it allows me to maintain a clear mind. Um, and I feel quite, quite relaxed. Sometimes I might have a bit more Carver. Uh, if you do that, that's getting into a recreational um use and you might feel a bit of a buzz you know feel a bit chill a bit, bit more of a relaxation effect um so it really is dose dependent and it depends really how you want to use it um but my personal feeling and advice is that um yeah carver is 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 wonderful if it's used i guess intermittently as needed as part of general stress and, and anxiety management rather than for a specific medical usage okay Thanks for thanks for being real on that. I like that you're talking about, you know, in the moment before speech or before you're talking with the crowd and then relating it to relaxation. In my mind, I'm thinking a lot about kava, much like we are starting to use CBD. And in my mind, I'm wondering what folks might be thinking on this podcast if they're going, oh, well, kava sounds a lot like CBD. Have do you have any research that you've done or anything that you know in terms of kava and mixing it with other herbs? Because I'm thinking that kava doing some very similar chilling out effects like CBD may have some interactions. Yeah, and it's it's worth bearing in mind that those interactions can be potentially very positive. They they can also be negative. So I think that's when we need a bit more precision in terms of obviously clinical advice uh, and assessment, but also research. Uh, and, and look, I'm very passionate about looking at combinations of plant medicines. And, and one of those, as you said, CBD and kava, uh, you know, a wonderful uh, potential combination there, um, especially considering that uh, from memory, the Yangonin uh, uh, interacts with, as one of the kava constituents, interacts with the CB1 uh, receptor. So um, there might be something you know, synergistically with CBD and, and, and kava, uh, which can really be quite exciting. So, you know, we do need more research with that, uh, absolutely. But I think to, to me, I guess I, just I guess I'll give you a little bit of a snapshot of my own perspective and, and, and feeling on this and how this has evolved. I guess originally we wanted to trial kava to see could this be, a, a you know, another sort of gold standard uh, intervention for generalised anxiety disorder, such as, say, a, an antidepressant. And uh, there was some preliminary evidence that, yeah, look, it had that, that, that ability, that level of strength. But we recently conducted, you know, quite a compelling study uh, and it showed that, well, no, in fact, it, it didn't outperform placebo in regards to people with generalised anxiety disorder. So, you know, sort of taking another look at the literature and the previous positive studies we've done, because we've done a range of very uh, positive studies show that, that kava can certainly reduce anxiety and, and stress. And, and just my overall sense of the literature and talking to people is that, look, kava, I think, has an incredibly valuable role as far as society's uh, use in that, you know, reducing anxiety, stress. But I would see it more along the lines of how people use coffee or tea or if they use alcohol in moderation, you know, sort of a glass of wine here or there, maybe CBD as well. You know, it's part of that that wellness um, focus, you know, which I really feel that society, especially Western society, is strongly moving towards, you know, that we're looking at things to be a part of our life, to reduce our stress, uh, to improve our mood, um, rather than using it, you know, systemically as a medication every day we've got to use. You know, we're, 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 we're bringing things in and out to improve the wellness of our life. And I think that Carver... You know, just like a good cup of green tea or, you know, um, 
people do yoga or whatever they want to do, maybe CBD or who knows what, lots of things. Um, you know, it's part of that wellness that wellness model, and I think yeah, carpet certainly has a good role in that. Absolutely, I like that it it's something that you don't have to take every day. I like that your thought process in terms of it's something you can pick up in the moment if say stress is becoming overwhelming or if you want to just chill out and yeah. it's it's much more of an alternative than, you know, using, you know, alcohol too much in excess and things of that nature. Now, you were saying that there are some effects with kava in high amounts if you've done if you've overdone it for yourself and i think at this point i would love to hear what the too much kava in the system symptoms are like in terms of side effects or in terms of what too much kava might be like so folks can get a sense if they're going to try it on their own what they need to do or what they need to know about in terms of dialing in the dosage because i i know a lot of folks who listen to my podcast like to play around with certain herbs and things of that nature and of course you know practitioner like myself i'm sure you're thinking well make sure that you have someone on board that can guide you but say someone's going to play around with it a little bit and they want to see how they feel what would be some guidelines for them to notice in terms of if you've had too much kava you might experience x y or z yeah, well, the first thing to say is that, that certainly with our research, for some people they may have, uh, if they do liver function tests, a little bit of a, a blip, a bit of a quirk in their liver function readings. So sometimes you do get a, a raise of, for example, GGT you know, might, might go up. Now, um, so in terms of, of excess amounts, that may also sort of tweak the liver a bit. Now, that's not to say that that's causing any liver damage or any issues. But um, it is something in very, very rare, I mean, incredibly rare you know, cases you can imagine that for whatever reason that person genetically gets a bit of a tweak of the liver. Maybe they have a pre-existing liver condition, they're taking other medication, maybe they drink alcohol on top of that. You know, so I just to, to be very, very, very safety conscious, um, it's the sort of thing of people having carver regularly and they know that they've got um, you know, some other things which may affect their liver function. There's nothing wrong with recommending clinically, uh, you know, a liver function test. But we found in our own studies that even if there's a, a bit of a liver quirk, that sometimes, oh, so I should say most of the time based on um, the evidence which we've seen, uh, it does sort of normalise and it's probably just the liver adapting to processing a, a, a new substance, if you know what I mean. I mean, certainly used uh, traditionally in the South Pacific, uh, it's, it's, it, Carve is very, you know, there's no major health issues at all and, you know, there's never really any issues pop up with the liver. So I just wanted to, I guess, completely clarify the liver element um, because I know we didn't quite capture it completely before. Uh, But in terms of what other effects, uh, like I said, it's a dose-dependent natural product, or you know, but it's still a drug uh, in terms of the strong effect it can elicit. So when you do have a good dose of kava and once again I'm recommending people follow the you know health guidelines in terms of what is uh, in their jurisdiction what are they uh, instructed to take over in Australia it's no more than 250 milligrams of kava lactones a day um, but obviously traditionally people might be having uh, you know 10 times that amount wow. of, uh, of kava lactones yeah if they're, <laughs> if they're having you know bowls and bowls of it recreationally so uh, you know it's a well. I said it's a free world, but it isn't. Um, it's certainly in America. Um, <laughs> if you guys like it, you know, it's a. What you said it's a free, free country. So just you know, if people want to do what they want to do, do whatever you want. Um, but uh, I've given everybody the guidelines there. Um, so if people do extend beyond that, let's just say in a cultural, you know, um, recreational sense, like they do in the South Pacific, um, you know, the muscles will start to get floppier and more relaxed. You know, people may get. And it's different. It is subjectively different. People may get a buzzy effect. I know if I have, if I'm doing a carver ceremony and I have a few bowls, I'll feel actually quite mentally buzzy, um, but then f- physically relaxed. Um, some people also may have a, a different effect. They actually might feel quite tired and 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 sedated. And people tend to, yeah, like like talking and they open up. They're more loquacious. They they they, they still like to connect, and that's probably a a sense of being in that ritualized group around the carver bowl. 
Um, and if you have a heck of a lot of it and very strong carver, like happens sometimes with green carver in Vanuatu, people will or have been known just to pass out, you know, oh. and wake up. Yeah. So <laughs> So stay at home if you're really gonna hit the kava hard. I think yeah, look exactly. And I think you know, people need to be sensible, certainly if they are having lots of kava to not drive or operate machinery, you know, because it does impair physiological uh, function and, and reaction time at high levels. I think that's a good thing to note because, you know, any herbs, a lot of people think, oh, their herbs are natural. What is really going to happen? And I think it's important to note that. So thank you so much for noting the comments of not operating heavy machinery while under the influence of kava. I also kind of put it out to CBD as well. And depending on how much THC is in there at the same time. Now, when you were mentioning CBD and I kind of brought that up, I didn't mention anything about THC. Have you done any research in terms of THC and interaction with kava? Is it much the same as using CBD or is it coming with the potential to augment effects of the relaxation? Yeah, it's a great question. And the reality is we just don't know. There hasn't yeah. been any, any science uh, conducted in that. I, I, I'd love to do a, a study mm. into that. So if anybody wants to fund me for that, that'd be great. <laughs> um, oh, I just think it's fascinating, you know, all these different combinations and, and how you can you know, tweak various uh, neurochemical pathways. Uh, my sense is, and once again, this is uh, anecdotal, not personal, but uh, just from when I've spoken to people who have tried the two, that they do say it certainly does elicit quite a strong uh, yeah, sense of relaxation, uh, the combination. But, um, yeah, I mean, I can't obviously advise people anything clinically related to that because, uh, A, in Australia, the combination is not legal, uh, as far as I'm aware, and B, uh, yeah, I mean, we just don't know. There's <laughs> not the, the science in terms of being able to comment on the safety regarding that. Sure, sure. No, I don't mean to put you on the spot. It's definitely something that I think in the back of my mind, only because here in the U.S., now that we've got a lot of different states starting to legalize marijuana and legalize the use of both the, you know, THC products and the CBD. CBD is, is countrywide. We can utilize it now, but the combination of the two is only effective um, in terms of certain states. And I know some people might be listening to this going like, all right, I'm going to get some kava and I'm going to get some little THC and CBD and I'm going to get high as heck. So it's things that I like to, you know, put out there so that folks know like what their limits might be if they're going to play. And I don't actually recommend playing till we have a little bit more data on it. However, folks are going to do what they want to do. So I'd like to give as yeah. much info as possible. However, one of my biggest kind of complaints with CBD is that you have to use a lot, it seems, over time to maintain effectiveness. Some folks might get an effect for a while at a lower dose, and then it seems you have to keep upping it. Have you found that to happen with kava, or does it seem like you said that that no greater than 250 milligram dosage seems to be kind of where folks will get symptoms or not symptoms, but get the relaxation effect and they don't have to keep adding more and more each time they take it. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, oh gosh, in terms of, yeah, with, you know, there hasn't been that much research or I'm just trying to sort of search my brain to think what's out there in regards to, you know, looking at, you know whether people will need higher dose that there, there'd be you know some um, adaptation to to the carbolactones that you know they need increased amounts. Um, from what I understand, that 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 there isn't that tolerance. Um, that you know people use it regularly and and certainly anecdotally people aren't commenting. Oh, I need much more to get a stronger effect. Um, so I think that's the you know it's that 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 element is yeah. Um, isn't a big issue. Um, it, one thing I would say is it, it really depends on the individual in regards to what sort of effect they get. I mean, I, I, there is with any substance always some overlay of a placebo effect, especially for affective disorders, you know, people with anxiety conditions and so forth. You give them something, you know, 
25, 30% will say, wow, this is great. I feel so relaxed and you've given them a placebo. So there's always that overlay, which I do wonder about. You, know, you hear about these people having, you know, one, one, one tablet or they take half a tablet, uh, you know, a tiny amount of kava and they say, oh, it's too strong for me. It blows my head off. And I always wonder about the placebo effect, mm-hmm. you know, to be honest with that. But it, it really depends, I think, on the, on the individual. Some people will, yeah, need, need more, some people less. And, and um, you know, it's the psychological makeup of the person, the pharmacogenomics, uh, yeah, I mean, there's various aspects. So I can't really comment in terms of what people would, would need uh, to get an effect. Uh, except to say that, um, yeah, they just have to, I guess, work out what's right for them. Sure, sure. No, I think I think that's great to hear because what I'm finding just with CBD is that some people have to take more and more and more over time, and it doesn't sound like you have to do that with kava, which ultimately I like that because it's not as – wild you know in terms of how much you're giving someone because i think to myself if i give someone something and they're and they're keeping taking more and more and more what are the other trickle down effects that are happening in the body so i like that you know we have at least somewhat of a standard with what is effective in terms of kava for a baseline for folks at least at the very least yes okay so we've went through a lot on kava. I would love to give folks maybe a little bit in terms of a area that they can research a little bit more, perhaps a compiled website or something where they can find your research. So where do you hold your research online? Where Do you have a space where some, everything's kind of compounded where folks can look at it all at the same time, like a resource area? Gosh, that would be interesting, having my own <laughs> little Professor Jerome Saris website with all yeah. my research on that. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be nice and narcissistic. I could, I could do that. <laughs> um, I, I don't. I don't. Gosh. Uh, well, I mean, I'm on Twitter occasionally. Uh, I've, I'm obviously based at Nikon. That's N-I-C-M. Health Research Institute, so we've got some links there. But you know, the sad reality is, with publications, with a lot of our work, uh, unless they're open access, you know, you've unfortunately the public have to pay for the articles. So, uh, okay, uh, yeah. But that's why we do, you know, these podcasts and media work, so we can disseminate the data and get it out there and connect with people. So, um, yeah. But you know, if, that, if they're interested in in a particular article, then feel free to contact me and I'll see if I can get it for them. That's no problem at all. Okay, perfect. I will put your contact info in my podcast notes at drjkrausnd.com or the healthfixpodcast.com. Wow. I know a lot more about kava now, and I'm hoping that my audience now is jazzed up about considering playing with kava a little bit and seeing if it can help them take the edge off the effect of everyday stress. Thank you so much, Professor Cyrus, for coming on my podcast. I really appreciate it. That's been wonderful. And uh, look, thank you for for allowing me the opportunity and, and have a great festive season. Yes, thank you. You as well. Wow. That's a lot of info on kava. And I have to admit that I actually haven't used kava that much in my practice. And Dr. Suarez has got me thinking that I need to change things up a little bit. And perhaps thinking a little bit about how that integrates in helping folks with CBD, maybe not having to use as much CBD. I don't know. My brain's going. I hope yours is. I hope you're thinking about kava a little bit. MediHerb is a great company for kava. I can help folks with getting a hold of that because you have to have a practitioner that can order that for you. So you can always hit me up at drjkrausnd.com if you're interested in using kava. Definitely want folks who have listened to this and are interested in it to at least reach out to a practitioner and make sure that you do not have any drug herb interactions that would cause trouble for you. But I think that kava could be a novel item to help us to just deal with the effects of everyday stress, maybe keep us from drinking too much. I don't know. It's a thought I have, and I definitely think that kava could be of interest. So if you know someone that could use this information, share this podcast with them. 
Hey everybody, Dr. Janine Krause here. If you liked what you heard today, then head over to drjkrausnd.com to find my free resources and information to know when I post something new that's juicy that you might want to check out. Plus, head over to where you get your podcasts and like, subscribe, and write a review to help get the word out about me and help others at the same time to find me. It really does help and I really appreciate all of your reviews.